my recording going? All right, so back to what I was talking about with R. Um, so I love the fact that it's that it's open, it's freely available. The other thing to know, and one of the reasons for this workshop that I think I hear a number of you guys um, mentioning is um, depending on your field of research, a couple people mentioned, you mentioned sort of developing a tool, so psychometrics. There's actually a lot of really good stuff that I can show you um, that support the psychometrics field um, in terms of library and library science and even just the people that you support in research. Um, R, I think, in some ways is leading the way with a lot of um, what I think of as sort of unstructured data and even and even text. There's um, I didn't bring my text mining book, but there's been a big development in that area in R here in the last couple of years. So so that's gaining popularity. Um, and even some bibliography management stuff is is getting better. <laughs> um, so um, okay. What else was I going to say? Let's see. Um, there are some big differences between, say, using R versus SAS, SPSS, um, st even SATA. Although SATA, most people, and I don't know a lot about SATA, but it still has sort of that command line interface. Like you're usually typing stuff at the prompt as opposed to a pull down menu, like an SPSS. You go and you say, okay, I want to do an analysis, and then you click regression, and it walks you through. Um, and there is something I can show you guys later um, with R that has a pseudo interface to that. Um, and I have a feeling more is going to be developed in the days and years to come. Um, but the thing that's fantastic about it is there's so much out there that just you could download and use right now. And if you have just enough R, R understanding, you could just use those programs. Like if somebody's already written a program, like you were talking about environmental science, there's a couple of people I follow with some of the um, USGS. So um, I know it's not quite environmental science, but the US Geological Survey, there's a ton of people who use R. So if I'm wanting to do something where I might want to look at waterways or watersheds, there's probably somebody at USGS that's written it, and I can just go download what they've done and maybe modify it for my problem or my area. Um, so those are some of the things I like about it. It's like, you know, somebody else has probably already invented it. <laughs> I'd like to just be able to use that tool. Um, so anyway, oh, and sorry, before I was, I was supposed to read this before I started. started. Um, this continuing education activity is approved by the Alabama State Nurses Association as an accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. So I guess you guys are getting CEUs for this, so yay, okay. Continuing nursing education credit is awarded for the actual time spent. You have to come to 100%. I'm not taking attendance. Uh, <laughs> to get the contact hours, participants should get their evaluation document via email on Saturday, right after the conference. The deadline for submitting the evaluation is April 7th. Um, SNR has participate in planning this activity, and no conflict of interest exists. So, awesome. If you guys have any other questions, let me know. I'll try to find out. <laughs> Okay. So how many of you guys, I know a lot of you guys were telling me you had downloaded the software. Were you able to find and download the materials from my GitHub repository? So um, how many people before I sent you this email had ever heard of GitHub? No. Okay. So GitHub is a little bit kind of like Dropbox or Google Drive or any other sort of cloud file sharing entity. Um, the reason it's called GitHub, it's a, it's a hub a repository, um, but turns out actually under the hood, it uses Git, which I'm not going to teach you guys that in this workshop, but just so you're aware, Git is an open source um, version control software, meaning that how many of you guys have ever, you, know, you start working on a document, and then at the end you put the date, maybe it's version one, version two, you put your initials, you send it to a colleague, they edit the document, add their initials. I got a paper the other day by email and literally had five different sets. It had the date, the change date, and five different sets of initials on the end. So so we're sort of already doing version control badly that way. <laughs> um, this actually has software underneath it that tracks everything. Um, and so one thing I wanted to show you, um, in addition to this just sort of being a compilation of all the files, which you can download here. Um, and some of my students, since they have to use Git for our class, if you have your own GitHub account, if you click the button at the top for fork, 
it will actually copy everything here out of my account and put it in your account. So like it's got kind of like moving between two two people's Dropbox folders or whatever. So so you have that advantage. And GitHub is free also. So not you don't have to sign up. Um, but one thing I was going to show you, because um, I did mention this in the course materials, is um, you can click on any file that's in there. Um, most of it's just text, really. Um, and you can view the file. But the other thing is it has these two little buttons over here. One's called blame, which is sort of funny, and one's called history. And so if I click on history, this is just basically the readme page for this repository. This shows you every time I've made an edit to the file. Um, and I've usually added some little comment that says what I did to the file. Um, mostly it's just little notes to myself. Um, and it's actually sort of funny if you really get into GitHub, look at what people do to read their comments. Because <laughs> after a while, you just, you're just abbreviating. It's like, I did stuff. <laughs> so it's not terribly descriptive. Um, but the neat thing is all these little links on the right are actually tracking which version. So for example, if I wanted to see what it looked like a week ago before I made my update, I can actually click on that and it shows me I didn't have anything in the repository a week ago. This is before I really had anything. I had one file. <laughs> so, um, so it's kind of neat. It has this sort of built-in version control. And the only reason I mention that um, is that you'll hear it again. Um, if you read about reproducible research, that's becoming a big conversation, especially in team-based research. So the other piece, the other button that was here is this button blame. Now, I'm the only one <laughs> updating this repository, um, but you'll notice it has my little icon face, and then it has what I did. Um, I could show you, since Wi-Fi is working, this is awesome. I can show you a couple of other things. That's an exciting group next door. Um, let's see. Oh, no, well, is it working? I'm trying to see if I could find. Um, so Vicki Hertzberg is um, my colleague that and she and I co-teach a um, big data course together. And um, let's just see. If I can find a file that we maybe have both committed to. Um, well, anyway, the bottom line is is that she and I work together back and forth, and so you could actually come in there and so, for example, if she and I were both working on a file and making edits to our class notes as we go through the semester, you'd see stuff that said Melinda Higgins did this on this date, Vicki Hertzberg did this on this date, um, and so you can imagine. If you've got a large team, um, usually you don't have people all hacking on the same document. You might. Um, but it's more like um, in a large study, you might have somebody who's working and bringing in this section of clinical data. Somebody else is bringing in um, maybe stuff from the microbiome. You know, maybe somebody else is bringing in exercise study data. You know, so you could have um, multiple people contributing, and this gives you a great way to sort of track what's going on and everybody's looking at what everybody else is doing. It makes it a lot more transparent and thus hopefully <laughs> reproducible. So, um, so that's one of the cornerstones of reproducible research. Um, and I'll come back to some stuff in here um, in case you're wondering what everything in here is. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our markdown here in a couple of minutes. You guys will be working with our markdown files during the course. Um, from each of those, you can produce different kinds of documents. Um, and so I've got HTML and PDF are two different formats for those output documents. And then I've got six modules I'm going to take you guys through, sort of six sets of exercises. Um, there's some other little files in here that just sort of support the project. Um, and then I have things with like figures and images that come in with some of the documents. Um, so that's basically what's here. There's two little sections of R code um, that you guys will see, Module 2 and Module 3 R code. And I saved them as PDFs also in case you just wanted to look at it or for a little bit easier printing. So all the PDFs you can um, hopefully easily print. So this is basically my copy of everything, and now you have a copy of everything also. So.
So let me, I'm sorry, let me load my slides. I had them up earlier, but I'm going to reload them real quick. All right. So any questions? And guys, shout stuff out. Stop me. Holler <laughs> as you as you have questions. In theory, no. So, so the question that was asked is, you know, is there a limit to the amount of data? Um, I think in general, no. Um, I do know, however, if you want to upload a file that's bigger than I think it's 50 megabytes, um, you have to kind of get a waiver. I, and I think the default account, which is a public account, they won't allow you to do anything larger than about 50, but then they have a pro. Like if you pay, there's like a, it's kind of like a Dropbox, like you could pay for more. Um, but just in general, I, I mean, I know people have tons of stuff in there and haven't never. By the way, um, the other thing that this is fantastic for, besides all the version control and file sharing, um, you can actually host web pages. So, um, for example, my course website here, this course, this is our big data course that we teach. Um, this is actually running off of GitHub. So I put together the website, and it's all being served off of GitHub. And I believe, I don't think it's still true, but when the Affordable Care Act first rolled out, that sign-in and enrollment, um, that was actually hosted on GitHub. So, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but it was it was years ago. I know, I know GitHub was involved at least initially. Um, I doubt it's still hosted there, but it was at one time. Mm-hmm. So when it's public, everything is just open. You can have a private account. You do have to pay for it. It's, it's not terribly expensive. Um, for educational purposes, though, I will tell you this. If you're teaching a class, you can send a request to GitHub and set up what's called an organization. And for the purposes of education, you can have a private organization that's free. So for example, in my big data course, um, so when I log in as myself, I have these organizations down here, one of which is for my big data course. And this is private in that only the students that are enrolled in that course have access. Now they can see each other's work, so it's, it's semi-private. <laughs> um, but if you want a truly private account, you do have to pay for it. Um, I think so. I'll admit I don't know a lot about some of the particulars, for, especially for teams, but there are ways to set it up. Um, I know when I enrolled my students, I'm pretty sure when I set it up, I gave everybody, I think, rewrite access to their own repositories and read access to the others. Honestly, I'm still sort of figuring some of that out. Um, for the most part, though, at the beginning of the semester, I just I do this just so they don't feel quite as embarrassed. Like I really don't want my code that I'm learning <laughs> to be out there on the web. So, but they're all going through the same struggles. So at least they can share and commiserate together. Um, so, yeah, I, I know there's a lot more to that part of the management that I just honestly haven't gotten into a whole lot. So, sorry. Welcome to the class. Um, okay. So just a, a few little things. All right, so let me, I'm going to take um, a little bit of time. Let's see, y'all keep me on track. So we, we're about 25 minutes in. Um, I'm going to try to get you through the first sort of three modules. We'll see how the pace goes before the break at two. And I think that's a 15 minute break. Um, and then we'll get through the last three modules. So we'll just see how the pace goes. And like I said, you guys ask me questions. So in addition to just sort of pointing out some of the stuff about Git and GitHub, which is not the focus of this class, but um, I talked a little bit about R. Um, by the way, R actually originally came out of a language called S. <laughs> Eventually, we're going to write out letters in the alphabet. We got C, R, S, anyway. Um, and it was done by some, the, basically, the statisticians that used to be at Bell Labs, you know, years ago. And so, um, they put it together because they needed a language that really sort of had uh, data analysis and statistics at its heart. That, you know, the, the modules, the way it thought, the way it processed was focused on the analysis. Whereas other programming languages, just to give you guys a, uh, a piece of context, so how many of you guys in here have ever run a linear regression? Okay. One of the things under the hood that 
as a statistician, they made me learn how to do, and I was working on my degree in statistics, I had to learn all the matrix algebra that goes into how regression actually works. Well, okay, so there's matrix algebra that has to be run under there. When I was in graduate school, there wasn't, I mean, there was some statistics packages out there, but I had to write the code to do that matrix algebra. And I originally did it in Pascal. Other people have done it in Fortran, done it in C. It's painful, <laughs> really painful. And about partway through my graduate career, um, we finally got out of DOS, so I'm really dating myself. We got into Windows finally. Um, and then I actually learned something called MATLAB, which is another sort of um, programming language environment. Um, but I could do all of that matrix algebra that I needed to do for linear regression in one line of code in MATLAB. And you can do that same line of code in R and in S. And so when I moved over to statistics, I started learning S. And I learned SAS. They, I, I don't think you can get a degree in statistics without learning SAS. I think it's mandatory, honestly. <laughs> so, um, And then in sort of the mid-90s, um, S and S plus, sort of the commercial side of the house, they went started going off in a different direction. And it was getting really expensive. So some of the guys that were involved in the original creation of that language, they spun off R to keep it open source and free. And so that really started early 90s. It sort of started taking off mid 90s. Um, and since then, I mean, it has just exploded. R Studio, um, which is an interface to the R language, came on board. I probably first heard of R Studio maybe late 90s, early 2000. I, I can't, I couldn't tell you right now exactly when they were founded. So they do have a commercial arm. Um, and they actually do a lot of things commercially, but they also still have a very sort of free open source piece to what they do. And so the interface that you guys are going to work with today um, is still in that same vein of it's open, it's shareable, there's lots of contributors, um, lots of people around the world supporting it. So, so that's R&R &R Studio, and I think that's why it's gaining popularity. Um, the other thing is relative to SAS that I found out a few years ago teaching a short course at the CDC, um, the CDC is training people as fast as they can. They are rapidly moving, and probably not completely to R. I think there's always going to be a chunk of SAS just because there's been so much investment over the years. I mean, everything you do in public health, it's all in SAS. Um, there's a little bit of SPSS, but sometimes it's kind of hard to get a dig for it. Um, but that said, I've heard, I don't know that I've seen it in writing, that the World Health Organization has really bought into R in a big way just because it's internationally open, shareable. You don't have cross-country licensing issues like you do with SAS. Um, and so because of that, the CDC is starting to align that way also. And so I think they're, you're going to see them start going sort of 50-50 between SAS and R. Um, and so I think that's also driving a lot of why you're seeing a lot more R applications in public health. And, and, and some, it's starting to creep into nursing a little bit. Um, where I've seen it the most in nursing are for the people that are working in big data, that are working um, specifically with the microbiome, any of the OMS, omics field, um, you're, you're seeing a lot, of, a lot more R support for those. Um, and I think that's born out of a lot of that development came out of the biological sciences. And there's a whole other repository of R code that's out there in a, something called Bioconductor. So, um, so the packages that you guys downloaded, you actually downloaded those from CRAN, which is a consortium for R or something. I'll look it up in a second. The other big one is Bioconductor. And if you're going to do anything in omics, the microbiome, odds are you're going to end up downloading uh, um, basically R code packages out of Bioconductor. So, um, so those are two things to, to remember. All right, so that's R&R &R Studio. Reproducible research. So how many of you guys have heard that term? Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, I'll take a minute. Give me a sentence. What do you think reproducible research is, if anybody? Okay, 
Right. That sounds good. Um, another thought? Okay. Do you have a thought? So, um, so yeah, it's 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 sort of two things. One is, for example, um, UD is a third year graduate student. She and I are working together. I, I support a lot of the cardiac um, heart research um, and in the Emory School of Nursing. So, um, so UD and I have worked together quite a bit, and so she's working with some data sets that I've already worked on. And so sometimes it's really helpful for her to see things I've already run and vice versa so that, you know, it's making sure that we're sort of both <laughs> checking each other, really. Um, because how many times have you ever gotten um, maybe a file from somebody and you do the analysis and you just can't reproduce? Like, let's just see the average age of the participant. <laughs> and then you realize, well, they kept in 40 people, but I yeah, I decided there were two people that probably didn't apply. We needed to remove them. So so my average age is really based on 38 people. <laughs> now compound that, <laughs> you know, with any and everything that happens in all aspects of science. Um, you know, it's those decisions that we make that perhaps weren't captured in some way. I mean, there might be a note somewhere that may or may not ever see the light of day. <laughs> Or, especially for those of you that are going through graduate school, how many of you guys inherited something from a previous person? <laughs> and you picked it up and went, this is great. I'm supposed to take this research and take it forward to the next step. And you realize that the previous graduate student didn't leave you any notes, and the advisor has no idea what the graduate student really did. I, I had a couple of those in graduate school, too. So, um so the goal here with reproducible research is a couple of things. One, to make it more transparent and to really truly make it more reproducible. But even if you're the only one that's ever going to use this, it can be a huge time saver. So one of the things you guys will get out of today's, today's exercises is I'm going to show you how to take the data plus the code and the document. And they're all going to be tied together. So this is where SAS, SPSS, a little less familiar with JUMP, but I don't think JUMP has a documentation generation feature yet. They may. Um, I'm pretty sure Stata doesn't yet either. Um, I mean, you get output, right? But you're not going to click a button and send that output to the journal, right? So somewhere you've got to take the numbers and put them in a table <laughs> that's formatted to submit to the manuscript to the journal. Same thing with the figures. Um, and eventually, even for yourself, you know, you're going to come back to that, and, you're, and there's going to be a question from a reviewer, and you'll realize, oh, I need to maybe go back and tweak this analysis. Perhaps I'm going to change a covariate. There was some question about a theoretical importance. And you're like, yeah, OK, let's look at it from this perspective. So you go back and redo everything. Wouldn't it be nice if all of that was connected you don't have to cut and paste anymore. You click a couple of buttons. You change out this variable for that variable, and you run it again. Poof. So I say all of this. This is sort of my soapbox. I'm not totally eating my own dog food yet. So um, I've managed to do it on one or two projects, and it has saved me a huge amount of time. But I will be honest. I still do a lot of my data preparation and cleaning in SPSS. Most of my data comes to me in SPSS. Most of the people I work with. That's what they know, so I try to stay within that environment to support all the researchers. But admittedly, there's things that uh, models or graphics or other things that I want to test out that aren't available in SPSS. So I, I export it. I do what the analysis sometimes in R and then bring it back. So I'm still not probably the best person for doing all the data manipulation stuff in R. That's still a little painful. <laughs> so. All right, so I just had a few things here I wanted to point out. So I've talked about the workshop outline. Um, and just to let you guys know, in the beginning, we've already kind of covered some of this. So I'm going a little bit out of my own order talking about the workshop materials. I'll say more about the interface in a minute and just sort of working with R. And then after we do the break at 2, I'm going to really show you guys the nuts and bolts of creating documents and linking all this stuff together. So reproducible research. Um, and I'm not going to read all of these to you. You guys have copies of the materials. 
But the term reproducible research, depending on who you ask, is kind of dedicated or attributed to this guy, John Clarabeau, who is basically a physicist um, in his book on earth soundings analysis. I'm not even sure what earth soundings analysis is, but it's something in geophysics. <laughs> um, it's interesting to me when I was doing this research for my the course that I teach um, that actually going back to 1996 consort has really been supporting this idea um, especially about the whole you know making sure that we have standards of reporting so that clinical trials are comparable at some level um, there's some more things here about um, registering clinical trials making sure that things are there for people to look up this is a fantastic article. I encourage you guys, this was published in um, PLOS Med in 2005 by John Yanidis. Um, he's a Greek researcher. Um, and it's really interesting. It's a little pejorative in saying why most published research findings are false. Because uh, it sounds kind of bad. And it's not so much that they're false. It's not like people are outright lying. That's not what he's saying. But when you really get under the hood and you begin to think about the probability of, say, a false a lot more false um, outcome or, or false, you know, false negatives, false positives, really trying to nail that down um, gets tricky. You know, can I take a study that was done in Sweden and do that same study here? Will I see that this intervention, do I get the same outcome? Probably not. Uh, do they go in the same direction? <laughs> Is it, do, the, do I still see significance? You know, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, how many of you guys in here have ever done like meta analysis where you look at combining? Um, so there's a little bit of that under the hood, but this is a really well done article and it does get you sort of thinking critically about what you're, and when you get ready to evaluate the outcomes research. Um, some other things that have come along the pike from the FDA. Um, this is a really interesting, article that was published in 2011 about the low percentage of researchers who are actually satisfying the policies of journals. So journals are now, you know, and the NIH, honestly, saying you have to have a statement saying you're going to share your data um, and make your results available, right? That all sounds good. We, and we all have the best of intentions. <laughs> but I get that email from a researcher from the PI saying, I've gotten a request for the data from the study that was published five years ago. Can you provide the data? Okay, which data? How much of it? Are we sending the whole database? I mean, so, you know, it's not so much that people, I think some people do ignore those emails. <laughs> I know I, I ignore the ones that come from, was it ResearchScape or ResearchGate? But, um, you know, in terms of like, well, what is the letter of the law like in terms of these policies? And NIH is even, you know, in each cycle providing more and more information about how we're going to do this. And truly, some of the infrastructure is just now <coughs> catching up. Um, there's places called Dryad, Figshare, Harvard has a data clearinghouse. Um, so there's a lot of these different places. It's like, okay, I have the data. How do I make it available? Can I put it on some governed repository? <coughs> Um, how many of you guys have heard of this study? So this was <coughs> the Duke Cancer Study. It was a really big deal a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago. So Duke was doing these actually multiple clinical trials looking at aligning cancer treatment based on the gene type. And um, these two researchers here, Kevin, Coombs and um, <clears throat> Keith Baggerly were at MD Anderson down in Texas. They wanted to reproduce what Duke was doing. So they contacted him. Duke agreed, sent him their data, sent him their code. And so um, they started diving into it. First thing they found were there were spreadsheet errors, where honestly one of the ones, and I encourage you to link down here, kind of it got cut off the screen projector, but then the files that you guys have, there's a link here to his basically TED talk on it. It really gets into all the details of what happened. But basically, there were a couple places where everything was off by one row. So um, you guys have mentioned S, um, SPSS. Anybody in here ever worked with RedCap software? Okay, it's a 
it's a way to manage data for like clinical trials and stuff. But it turns out when you export data out of the REDCap data collection system, if you export it to Excel proper, it will give you the data and at the top there'll be a row with like age, gender, um, you know, all the variable names. It has a header row. If you export it to SPSS, you get a stripped down Excel, comma delimited file, that does not have a header row because it has a syntax file that comes along with it that provides all that information. So one of the things that they found was there were places in the software and in the code where probably the people at Duke knew what was going on, but as soon as they handed it to somebody else and they started running it, they realized they were getting these off by one row. Well, if you're off by one row, you're being assigned the wrong gene therapy. And so that was the tip of the iceberg. I, I mention it here because these are easy human mistakes to make. So it's just always a good idea, honestly, to have somebody else look at it and go, oh, you know, we're making these assumptions. We need to document this because somebody else may not it may use it incorrectly. Um, the other thing they did find once they got into it, turns out there was actually some sloppy research going on. There was actually outright fraud that was happening. The, the lead PI, he's long since been fired, and there's, there's legal cases pending. They've shut down all the trials. They've had papers retracted, and there's a bunch of court cases. So it's still ongoing. But I mentioned it because it started with this sort of spreadsheet alignment issue. The other one that's, I think, really interesting, and um, if you guys listen to politics, this is kind of a big conversation, I think, in um, Obama's second term, and there was a lot of haranguing going on and looking at economic models and so forth. And this paper was actually quoted several times. Matter of fact, Tim Geithner and some of the guys there um, is this growth in a time of debt. You may have heard of that article. It was written by two guys up at Harvard, two economists, and it was published, very well respected, <clears throat> did fine. It claimed that countries that had debt greater than 90% of their GDP had slower economic growth. Seems logical, right? Well, a few years after this was published, Thomas Herndon's an econ, economics graduate student at University of Massachusetts at Amherst, went to his professor and said, you know, I've, I've, I, I need a project for this class. And he said, well, this paper was just published. Why don't you contact the authors at Harvard, see if they'd let you have their data, and I want you to reproduce their results. So he said, okay, great. Seems like a simple enough assignment, right? Turns out the guys at Harvard were not happy to share the results. Sent them the data, the Excel file that actually had all the calculations and stuff in it. Graduate student found a major formula error. So probably what had happened was they probably had initial data on whatever their first set of countries was, ran through their analyses, got real excited about the results, and then decided, okay, we're going to add more data. Well, they added more data never went back and updated the spreadsheet formula. Like, you know, where you go and highlight, you've got like the first 40 cells, and then you've added 20 more cases, and you need to go, oh, yeah, I need to update this so it's all 60 cells. That's basically what happened. And so the original paper had actually left out data from Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and some other countries. So I tell you, I feel for this poor graduate student. It's like, I'm not going to tell them. <laughs> you know, I, I still haven't heard all of what happened. but basically. This is called the Excel error heard around the world. Um, there's a few other things. That, the only thing I'll point out on here is um, the Center for Open Science, I think, is worthwhile learning a little bit more about it, the Open Science Collaboration. And they've been working on this for several years. And they've looked at over 100 studies. And of those, they've only been able to replicate the results. Remember I said, like, if I had a study in Sweden and I replicated it here, could I get the same results? They've only been able to do that in about a third to half of those 100 studies. So that, that's another kind of reproducibility. You're not, you're really working with a brand new patient group, um, but do you get the same results? Maybe not. Um, this is another one that was published a couple of years ago in gene biology, or genome biology. And what I wanted to point out was, turns out almost all of us work in Microsoft Excel at some point, even if we're just moving data files. Um, we may not be doing our analysis in Excel, but out of the box, there's a lot of defaults that Microsoft sets in Excel, one of which is it tries to be smart about interpreting what it thinks you want. Turns out there's actually a lot of gene names that look 
suspiciously like dates. So September SEPT2 is really septin 2, and March 1 is this membrane-associated ring finger. Don't ask me to explain what that is. I don't know, and so forth. But these are converted by default to September 2nd and March 1st. Could be a problem, right, if you're wanting to just have this recognized as a gene name and not a date. Um, it turns out there's some other, and I don't know what a Riken identifier is, but they evidently have these long sequences of numbers. This gets converted to a, a number in scientific notation. So it's no longer a code, but an actual numeric value. And then there's the, a couple of other things here with the, with the date names. But it turns out there was a, the economist did a review of this, and this is a little hard to see on the screen, but some of the papers here. So for example, in Nature, roughly 30% of the papers, genomics papers in Nature, um, they found spreadsheet errors in the supplemental files over a 20 or 10 year period. So, um, so again, it's this idea we really need to get a handle on this. And I think truly SAS, SPSS, I think a lot of the point and click type software, they're coming on board. They're, they're working. Um, and let's face it, I mean, in SAS, you can have a SAS program. So you do have your data in your code. So a lot of that already exists. It's just making sure that we're not accidentally making the mistakes when we take the output and put it into the published results. Like I even had one the other day, and I usually try to double check, and I have other people read my stuff. I mean, how many of you guys have been sitting there, and you're going down a list of results, and you're typing in the p-values over here, and it really is a p-value less than 0.05, and you accidentally type 0.5? That, that's my goal. I want to get to the point where I'm not making those mistakes anymore. Um, so some people to know, and I've got the links here, so there are a bunch of different books. Um, but this is a fantastic one. If you just want to know some more about the reproducible research environment, um, Victoria Stodden actually is a lawyer, and there's some fantastic stuff that she writes in this book about understanding some of the intellectual property issues. So a big conversation we have is, okay, I'm fine. I'm willing to share my data but once I'm done with it, right? I mean, let's face it, we all want to get published. We want to do really good things. The NIH is providing guidelines on that, like you have a certain amount of time before you have to release it. Um, so there's a big conversation about what we have to provide, what we really have to share, et cetera. So making sure that we're not losing that intellectual property and investment. Because let's face it, research is hard. It takes a long time to get that data point. Um, and as I tell my students, one thing that I, I've been really cognizant of, especially working in health, is that those data points are people's lives. And in many cases, they gave their lives for that data. Because some of the populations we work with are really sick and in many cases die before the end of the study. So I'm, I'm just always touched that, you know, people are willing to participate in research. So I feel like we have a stewardship there and we have to honor that. Um, but Frederick Leish, I'll say more about him in a couple of minutes. Roger Ping is up at um, Johns Hopkins, and he's got some fantastic, he's got a bunch of other books out there on reproducible research in R, um, and he's a really good one to look at. He's also the lead um, uh, reproducible research editor for the Journal of Biostatistics. Um, UEG is a, um, he works at our studio, and actually the knitter package that you guys are going to work with today, he wrote. And so these two books have some fantastic stuff. This one's really about Knitter. So if you wanted to just focus on understanding how to do all this document creation, this is a really good book. It's a little programmy. It's, it's not terribly user friendly, but if you really want to understand how this process works, this is the book. Um, he has another one called Book Down, which it turns out all the tools I'm going to show you guys today, you can actually use to write a book, which is really kind of cool. Um, another person, I, I showed you guys a little bit about Git and GitHub at the beginning, is Jenny Bryan. She's a static statistics professor up at um, British Columbia, and she recently joined our studio team. And so she's actually got a book that hasn't been technically published, but it's online and everybody uses it, so in my mind it has been published. Um, it's a book called Happy Git with R, and it, it explains how to, how to keep all of this stuff tied together with GitHub and version control and all that. that I teach some of that to my students, but there's not enough time to cover that today. Um, a couple of other interesting books that are out here, and I've got those listed, with Nicholas Hortman and Ken Kleinman and Chester Ismay and so forth. 
Um, another one that I didn't have listed up here, and I'll pass this one around, is this book. Um, and it's by Robert Kabakoff. Um, and it's called R in Action. And you can see I actually spilled coffee on it. <laughs> so I use this book a lot. Um, and this does a great job of sort of taking you by the hand and walking you through applications. And he gives you the code. He explains what's going on, explains the output, and so forth. Um, another one that's really good that I use with my students a lot, how many of you guys have ever heard of Andy Field? Yes, no. So Andy Field, uh, he really started, he's a child psychologist researcher. Um, and he's got a great book out there. It really started it with SPSS, which was sort of um, discovering statistics using SPSS. And that one was has now in the fourth or fifth edition. I think now it's done by Sage Publishing. Um, but he has since co-written that same book in SAS and in R. So you, if you've ever used that discovering statistics book, um, he now has one that is in R. And it's the same data examples, the same sort of statistical methodology explanation, but he now has one in SPSS, one in SAS, and one in R. And so that, um, he's a really good one to look at. Um, and I'm going to take one minute, just deviate for a second. Oh, actually, I just need a new tab. So that book there, so some resources that you guys can use. A lot of times if you do a search for something on how do I do X in R? You'll probably eventually have a link, if not on the first page of Google results, probably the second page, is a link to Quick R. <coughs> this site is run and maintained by Robert Kabakoff. So a lot of the stuff that's in that book is actually here on his website too. So if you don't want to buy the book, that's fine. Um, but there's a bunch of stuff. So like on here, you know, if you wanted to know, okay, statistics, say, how do I do a t-test in R? So you just click through, and he gives you examples. <coughs> Same thing with, like, regression, ANOVA. There's advanced statistics, data management, graphing. Like, here's histograms and box plots. You get the idea. All right. So the other terms that you may hear uh, along with reproducible research now is kind of the umbrella for a lot of the stuff that's um, coming along with it. But specifically, when I talked about we're going to take data and we're going to take the code and the documentation and link them, the idea of linking the code and the documentation really falls into sort of two things, either literate programming or dynamic documentation. And the two people that are arguably sort of the founders of that are Donald Newth and Frederick Leish. Frederick Leish sort of coined the term dynamic um, documentation. And he had a program that he wrote originally called Sweeve. Well, it turns out, for those of you that have used SAS, there actually is a SAS Sweeve where you can actually link creating a document back to your SAS code. Now, it's not terribly friendly, and it's a little kludgy, um, but it does work. And then before that, Donald Newth had done some stuff, and his was, I think, Pascal and LaTeX. I learned Pascal, but I've never learned LaTeX. So if you ever work with mathematician and a computer scientist, maybe some of the sort of like geeky computational biologists, they don't write documents in Microsoft Word. They're using LaTeX to write documents. Um, and that's a whole, that's like learning how to write a programming language. For a document. So I'm trying desperately not to learn LaTeX, <laughs> although I'm getting little pieces of it. Um, a couple of other people. So I mentioned the SWEEP package that took SAS and merged it to sort of document creation. Um, simultaneous out there. <clears throat> so when you're on the web, just to give you an idea, like this technically is sort of a, a web page, or let me, let, we'll go to the Quick R site. If you right click, there's a button on here that says view page source. Probably never done this and you probably don't ever want to do it, and that's fine. Um, but this is the code under the hood of that website. This is HTML, which is hypertext markup language. Turns out, um, just to let you know, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Word is what they call a YZWIG. What you see is what you get type of interface. 
So if you go in and you say, okay, I'm going to type in my header, and you highlight that and say, okay, I want to make that bold, font size 14, and oh, what the heck, let's add an underline, right? So it looks like it's going to look when you print it. Actually, under the hood, Microsoft Word is actually writing XML, which is another kind of markup language. So what you guys are going to kind of get a chance to see today is something called Markdown. And so this guy in 2004 said, you know, HTML, there's just too much going on. It's kind of a pain. I want to simplify that. I want to come up with just a very, very simple command so that we can get just a lot of web, st web stuff out there without having to write this, like, cumbersome HTML. So he came up with Markdown. What you guys are going to learn today is R Markdown. It's the, basically the Markdown that works inside R. And in 2012, UEG released Knitter. What Knitter does is it takes all the stuff that you're going to see where we're going to combine the code and sort of this markdown documentation and puts it together so that you can compile documents into different formats. So when you guys get done, I'm going to show you specifically today, you can make an HTML so you can make a web page, or you can make a Word document. You can go straight from this into Microsoft Word. Isn't that fantastic? When I found out you could do this like three years ago, I literally was jumping up and down in my office. People probably thought it was crazy. Anyway, <laughs> I was like, this is so fantastic. Um, this is a little bit more about SWE. The only thing I wanted to highlight here is that things are sort of happening on the fly. There's a great way to automatically update your final document if your data changes, if you decide to make a different analysis decision. So in theory, you could set all of this up at the beginning of a study after you've collected data on, say, like five people. And then you go and you do great research after two or three years, you're done recruiting, you're compiling the data, you can now just plug it back in and the report in theory <laughs> should work the same for five people as it'll work for 500 or 5,000 or however many people or realistically we'll say 50 right now, <laughs> depending on how many people you can um, enroll and recruit. So this is the knitter package. The other thing, and this is this is the geek in me coming out, they've now started this whole trend where every new cute little package has its own little hexagon icon, and when you go to the RStudio conferences, people geek out and try to collect them, and then they stick them on the back of their laptops, and it's like a badge of honor. Anyway, so it's like, it's like collecting the things, you know, the pins when you go to the Olympics, or anyway. Um, and then this is our markdown. So which you guys are going to see. Um, this is just a little tiny piece. This leverage is something called Pandoc. So when I first started learning this like three, four years ago, this wasn't all put together. There were still a lot of pieces. Um, and I actually had to work with Pandoc independently. So that was like yet another thing you had to install. And it was, again, open source. But after a while, you're like, yeah, this is great. It's free. But I am tired of downloading and, you know, installing and <laughs> pasting and updating. Anyway, so Pandoc now, when you install RStudio, you get it. It's there. You're, just, you're not going to have to learn how to use it. <laughs> it's going to work. Um, so it's built in. But the cool thing about this is it's sometimes it's called the Swiss Army knife for converting files. And so um, this is kind of hard to read on purpose. But the big thing is, is that you can take a file in any format and convert it to any other format. So if you wanted to go like Microsoft Word to PDF, right? We, we can do that now. On, you can just say save as PDF. But suppose you wanted to go to something else, maybe an ebook format or some other open source word processing package, or you wanted to go from an HTML format to some sort of presentation format. So there's, there's some neat things about it that it, it understands the pieces that are in the document and how to rearrange those to meet these other formatting um, outcomes, if you will. Yes, this is free. So, so our studio, the beauty of this thing and why I'm such a champion of it, it really is the hub and the interface to all of this. So you, it, it's definitely the interface to the R programming language. But for the purpose of what I'm hoping you guys walk away from today, even if you never learn how to program in R, is that you could actually today use the RStudio interface and write a document with R Markdown. And then 
easily convert between all these formats and change things around and stuff. So um, for me, I think it's really fascinating. One, you could you can use this book down package to create books, um, which honestly I like that interface better than trying to write a book in Microsoft Word. Um, you can do it, but it gets complicated because there's so many different things that have to link together. Um, I, you can. You can write chapter one, chapter two. You can keep them separate files, which most people do. But if you really want to link it all, this is a great interface. Um, some other things, and we've talked some about this, so I'm not going to belabor it. But, um, but this slide here, I think, is worth talking about. Like, why would I? Oops, sorry. Why would I do this? So, think about what you do day to day. You know. What would be really great if you could just click a button and automate it, right? Um, what could you reuse? So you've started a study. Maybe that study's closed out. You're getting ready to start your next study. Well, odds are you're going to reuse some of the same process and approach to analysis. You know, could you maybe even reuse the code? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It depends on what you're um, capturing. But, you know, think about also in terms of submitting to the journals or, heck, even just writing um, reports in amongst your colleagues. You know, are there some standard formatting things? Um, for us in universities, it's usually a little bit more free form. But, um, but even on a name study, like some of our big R01 studies, one of the big conversations right at the beginning is we need a logo, <laughs> right? And so we've got some fantastic ones. In our caregiver study, it was like two hearts, you know, together and like holding hands because it's a caregiver study. Yeah, so there's some neat things like that. Well, I'm on in one right now that it has a beautiful logo. It's called Music for Health. So it's working and looking at sort of music and support and HIV population. And they have this fantastic tree and the tree is like made out of musical notes. So it's, you know, it's a way like, okay, would it be great if everything we do had that logo on it? Yeah, so there's ways to do some of that kind of stuff, sort of formatting. What do you want to share with your team? This is the one that sold me. <laughs> what do you find yourself doing over and over and over, you know, correcting or reformatting or, God forbid, cutting and pasting yet again? Um, like, I tell people all the time when I'm working on analyses, they'll be like, oh, we just added five people or we've decided to drop this person or whatever it is. And I've, I've spent all this time, got the report almost finalized, and they're like, can you rerun everything, we'll make this adjustment? I'm like, sure. The analysis will take an hour. It's going to take me two days to reformat the 100-page report. So <laughs> my goal is to get to where I'm at and do that. I'm not quite there yet. Um, the other thing is, too, I mentioned about working with other graduate students and picking up where they left off. But this is something um, I like to think about, too. Like, if you won the lottery today and walked out of your job, what would you leave behind? <laughs> what would you want to leave behind? to your other colleagues. All right, so let me make sure to see where I'm at. <laughs> okay, what time is it? Okay, so. A um, couple of others, the one package that you guys are gonna be working with today is the 538 package. It actually comes from some of the guys that worked at 538.com. How many of you guys ever looked at this website, especially during the election? Nate Silver and all of the projections for the election. Turns out, 538.com has now been bought by ESPN, so the look and feel of the website's a little bit different, but he's basically a pollster. Um, and they write all kinds of articles on pop culture and not just elections, um, but other kinds of surveys and questionnaires and sort of social interest type stories. Um, but it turns out most of their articles have the references and the links to their data that they collected. And in some instances, the code or at least an explanation of how their analyses were done and how they presented their final visualizations or graphics or results. And so some of those data sets are compiled in the exercises and things that you guys, specifically you guys are going to work on one that looks at fake preferences. It was a survey that they did, and we have data on um, – like how people like their steak prepared by gender, and um, that's all we're going to look at today. But the um, bigger data set has stuff in there about risk taking, and so there was this underlying question of like, are people who who want to skydive are they more likely to eat their steak raw? <laughs> you know, is there something about risk taking and how you like your steak? But there's some really neat um, other data sets in there as well. One of the guys that worked for 538 as a freelance journalist was this gentleman, Andrew Flowers. And I got a chance to hear him speak two years ago at our studio conference, 
and the recording of his presentation is here. And he talks about finding and telling stories, well, in this case with R, but with data. And at the end of the day, is that what we're really doing with research? That it's, you know, the data is interesting, you know, at least for me, <laughs> the analysis and all of that. But at the end of the day, there's a story we're trying to tell about why this is important, what clinical practice change we want to make, and so forth. Um, and so he talks about it from the perspective of journalism, and he coined the term sort of data journalism. Um, and he's a contributor to this 538 package. Um, talked a little bit about transparency. I know you guys probably don't read a lot in the Journal of Biostatistics, but I think this is coming. They sort of took the lead on this idea of marking papers based on how reproducible the research really is. So it turns out if you only have the data available, which is kind of where most journals are moving, they say you need to, if someone requests it, you need to make your data available to be published in this journal. That gets a mark of D. So that's like your entry level in the Journal of Biostatistics. The next one is, is your code available? And are you willing to share it? Then you get a mark of C. Finally, if both your data and your code are available and the associate editor for reproducible research, which is basically Roger Ping and his team, um, if they can do that and reproduce the results that you gave them in the manuscript submission, you get the gold star mark of R, meaning that this is a re truly reproducible. We have validated that this is reproducible research. And if you wanted to see an example of one that was submitted, there's a link here on this um, study on air pollution, which, Lisa, you might find interesting. Um, finally, this is probably the last thing I'll show you guys. This truly sold me. This is actually, this story is in that implementing um, reproducible research, the book by Victoria Stodden and Roger Ping, that first book that I showed you, <clears throat> buried in one of the chapters. And it, it's literally just a paragraph. But I like, as soon as I read it, I like highlighted it. In 20, uh, sorry, 2001, there was an outbreak of E. coli that killed 50 people in Europe. Really didn't make the headlines here. Or if it did, it was a blurb. And there's a link here to the article. So the researchers at this Beijing Genomics Institute was working with this group in Hamburg, Eppendorf, to sequence the genome of the pathogen. And given the severity of the outbreak, the team announced the genome on Twitter and opened it up to basically crowdsource the solution. So they basically sent out a cry for help to, worldwide to all these genomicists. They established a GitHub repository put what they had out there and began crowdsourcing these analyses. Within 24 hours, people started contributing and in five days, they had a bacterial agent proposed to kill the pathogen. Now, it, it took a little bit longer, I'm sure, to, to sort of finally vet all of that out, but five days to develop something to kill the pathogen. That just blew me away. So it's incredibly fast, transparent, and, I mean, in this case, they really were saving people's lives. So, I mean, sure, it's great for me if I can click a couple of buttons and write my report faster. But this is, I think, at the heart of really what we're doing. The ability to sort of keep all of this stuff tightly there, so it's sort of that speed of collaboration. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but a couple things I've talked about, taking the data and the code and putting everything together. Um, organizations, we talked a little bit about this. Basically, you need to be able to communicate well. Um, one thing I'll highlight here is making things human readable. <laughs> Come up with a file naming scheme and stick to it. <laughs> Whatever makes sense to you guys and your team. As opposed to file one, file two, script one, script two. Trust me, you might know it today. You're not going to know it two weeks, two months from now. Um, dissemination. Obviously, we talked a little bit about the speed of collaboration. The other one that I highlight is basically increased visibility. If you put it out there, you're the de facto subject matter expert. You may not want to be, <laughs> but uh, but that can be a good thing. Um, dissemination, I've got some links here. You guys have seen, you probably worked with some of these, like especially Dropbox and Google Drive. There are some different data repositories coming online. Those are growing. Um, some of the others that you may begin to kind of see, maybe in the footnotes 
of some of the manuscripts that you're reading are places like Figshare, Dryad, maybe even Bitbucket, where if you ever go and look at the supplemental materials in there, they'll say our code is available and they'll list where it's available and so forth. Um, stakeholders. I should probably just stop right there. <laughs> Yourself. <laughs> that should hopefully drive it. But um, oops, I'm sorry, I was clicking the wrong button. Um, but obviously your organization, your team, eventually you want to get this out to a manuscript and so forth. Um, let's see. Okay, so the big picture, and you guys have already seen this. We're not going to talk much other than what I just showed you at the beginning with Git and GitHub. In the class that I teach, we, we spend a little more time on this piece. Um, but the dynamic documentation, that part, is what we'll do um, after the break. And we're going to look at using all of that through the RStudio interface. Um, for the most part, we're not going to focus too much on the programming and analysis. You guys are going to get a taste of R, but I'm not really going to get a chance, chance to teach you much of the R language itself. All right. So any questions? I know there's a bunch there. I just kind of wanted to get through some of the background material and highlight some references for you all. All right. That's my last set of slides. Because, <laughs> yay, I didn't want to PowerPoint you guys to death. Okay. So you've got all these files that you've downloaded. And just to show you, um, so this R Markdown file, um, if you want to go back, and you guys will get a chance to see a piece of it here in a minute. But this is actually the file that I used to create all of those slides. And you guys are going to get a chance to see a smaller version of that in a few minutes. Um, and so that's how I created those HTML slides, was actually using R Markdown. So that's module one. That's just my slides. So, um, if you've got R in R Studio installed, go ahead and get it running. I'll give you guys a think you guys have mostly done it. Is there anybody here that wasn't able to? No, not quite. Okay. Well, for right now, I would say just follow along. Um, if we have time at the break and we can do it really quickly, <laughs> I'll help you. Um, but the Wi-Fi here, while we're connected, I'm not sure how fast it is. It may be actually better for you guys at the end to go back, listen to everything, and then go home and maybe try to um, download and install it again. Um, but so when you've got this, basically you have R, which is the programming language. Um, and then you install RStudio, which is an interface. It turns out you don't actually have to have RStudio. You can actually run R bare bones. Um, but it turns out if you do that, and a couple of you guys saw this when you downloaded it and installed it. Um, you get these two links, little icons, one's for the i386 and one's for the 64-bit. Um, it turns out if you have that, this is your interface. You're going to be forced <laughs> to type commands at the command line. So you really have to know the language because it opens up and it doesn't really give you any assistance. Um, and you can run R this way. It, it's totally fine. It's very bare bones, but it'll work. <coughs> but this is the interface I'm going to teach you. Instead, we're learning our studio. And the thing I like about this, while it's not, it's still not quite, there's no button that I can click on to say, I want to do some analysis and run a t-test. So it's, it's not a graphical user interface that way. Um, but it does give you a lot of things in terms of managing your files, your output, your visualizations. Um, I'm going to teach you a little bit of stuff here about the environment and understanding the whole R session and how things work together. So when it opens, um, unless you've gone in for some reason and like change, but this should be the default interface. Um, turns out you can actually rearrange all of these windows. I wouldn't advise it, <laughs> but you can. You can totally customize the whole thing. You can change the colors, the font size, all that kind of stuff. But it opens up, and this main screen here is the console. So this is basically the same thing that in the base R when I opened it up, you just have the screen and the little blinking cursor. <laughs> so you can still do sort of the command line typing code in. But then down here on the bottom right, there's some stuff here. There's actually a tab that says files. If I click on that, I can actually see what's in my directory. Like it's the same as being able to look at your file folder, or I um, can't remember what it's called on a Mac. Sorry, I'm not a Mac person. 
to file viewer. Does anybody in here have a Mac? <gasps> wow, half of my class is Mac. I figured I'd end up with at least half Mac. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, yeah, a lot of my students have Mac. Um, actually, Vicki, who I co-teach with, she teaches on a Mac. I teach on a PC. So it's kind of nice because we, we each know a different operating system. Um, but basically, your file explorer is the same information. So it's kind of nice in that with our studio, when you open it up, you can actually see your files right away. Um, there's a plots window. When we make plots, you'll be able to see those. Packages. So let me just take a minute and I'll mention packages. So probably SPSS and SAS and Stata and stuff that you have access to, more than likely, I'm going to guess, through the university license. Turns out, if you actually go and look at your license, it's not just like SAS one program. It's SAS and a whole bunch of add-on packages. Same thing with SPSS. Um, you don't get just bare bones SPSS. You get SPSS plus usually you'll get like the exact test module. You'll get the advanced statistics module. You'll, there's usually, I think there's some add-ons for some of the graphics. And um, so it turns out when the universities negotiate those licenses, they're negotiating the base package plus all of this added functionality. And it, it's somewhat standardized. Um, but I do remember, actually, at one point, SPSS, you guys remember when they, they added bootstrapping? Uh, you maybe never used it, but I was really excited when they released the bootstrapping module. And I actually called our university license manager. I'm like, are we going to get this one? Is it going to be in this year's license? <laughs> Can I put my vote in for yes? <laughs> so, um, so just like that, in R, if the only thing you had was R, you'd have base R, which actually has some decent functionality. It has a graphing um, uh, module. It has a basic statistics module. Um, I forget. There's a couple of others that are in there. But that would be all you'd have. So to really add the additional functionality to R, it's kind of like installing apps on your phone. You have to go and download and install these other packages. And so the ones that you guys had already done, you actually downloaded and installed from CRAN. So let me show you this. So when I'm here in our studio, if I click the Install button, which you can get to from this Packages window, or up under Tools, there's a, a link here for Install Packages, and you get the same window. So there's a couple ways to get to it. And I sort of glossed over this a little bit in the email, but it says, what repository do you want to go to? And you can add more. But CRAN is the default. And so when you start typing in, so one of the ones you guys installed was Tidyverse. So this is actually coming from the Comprehensive R Archive Network. So that's what CRAN stands for. And this is actually where you went to download R for either Mac or Windows. But over here on the left, there are, by the way, there's some interesting things on the R homepage and R journal and some other things. I also mentioned, um, so for example, I know you're going to be doing some stuff in psychometrics. Turns out if you click on task views, there's a link down here for psychometrics. So I won't get a chance if we have a minute either at the break or at the end if you are interested. But this link here talks about a whole bunch of the different packages and routines and things that are available in R for doing psychometric analysis, things like um, rash models or instrument response theory type analyses and so forth. Um, the one that I use all the time, if I can find it, let me do a search, is a package listed here. So factor analysis, principle analysis is linked here for a package called Psych. Um, and they have some fantastic information and tutorials and so forth. So I just mentioned that one. But it turns out if you click on packages, it will tell you that as of today, we currently have 12,339 packages available from CRAN. The other repository I mentioned, if you're doing anything in genomics or genetics, is Bioconductor. So again, this is sort of focused in the biological sciences, but let's see, it's usually up here on the page. Uh, I thought it was right at the top. Packages. Uh, 
Okay, so as of today, there's 1,477 packages available from Bioconductor. Um, and the one thing that I'll say about this is these repositories for these sort of software add-ons for R um, are fairly well monitored and controlled in that you have to meet certain coding standards, you have to meet certain documentation standards, all of those kind of things to be able to say, yep, it's ready to go. Bioconductor, I think, actually does some code testing to make sure that your algorithms and routines are doing what you say they're going to do. CRAN, I don't think, does that, but it does say that your your code meets these certain sort of um, standards for writing code and for writing the documentation with that code. Um, that said, you could have fantastic, pretty code and great documentation and still be spitting out garbage. So um, <clears throat> the rule of thumb that I've heard is Bioconductor is probably the best. CRAN is probably the second best, although a lot of stuff is just on CRAN anyway. And then sort of the third, which I would think of as the wild, wild west, is GitHub. Um, so it's getting better, and one of the things that's going on actually out there in sort of the code sharing world is the ability to be able to sort of test and vet code like on the fly. Um, so it's getting better, but keep in mind this is open source and people are just sharing it. So it's always like do your homework, right? You wouldn't install a random app on your phone without saying, okay, am I going to download an app that only 5,000 people have installed, or am I going to download one that 5 million people have installed? Um, the other one I look at is, does it cost me money? <laughs> if it costs me money, I'm not installing it on my phone. Um, but that said, you know, make sure that it's reliable. Other people have maybe used it, published it, that kind of thing. Um, and there's all kinds of stuff out there that you could download and play around with and test, but keep in mind, it's, you know, it's buyer beware. So those are the packages. And there's two steps to getting a package. So you download the package. And when it says that you're installing it, really the install here is it's downloading it from the internet and you probably saw this as it scrolled by on the page if you went through this. And then it says, um, you know, package has been downloaded and either I think it says unpacked or unzipped, and it gives you the directory location on your hard drive where that went. And once that shows up, then you'll see it in the list over there in your sort of library list of packages. That's step one. The next piece, though, in order to be able to use what's in there, you have to use a statement called the library statement. And this, I know that it's kind of hard to explain why they called it library, but this actually loads it into memory. And once it's loaded into memory, then you can use it. So it's kind of like with SPSS, SAS, et cetera, you know, I might have all of these great um, things there sitting on my hard drive, but if I haven't told SAS that I've like added the advanced graphing module or whatever, um, it's not going to know that it's available to use. It's, it's still, there's like two pieces. The one is like the downloading it, getting it on your hard drive, and the second piece is loading it into memory so that R knows it's there. So you'll see that in some of the exercises here in just a sec. <clears throat> All right, so any questions on packages? It's kind of, so it's sort of two pieces. We've got the R-based software, we've got the interface, and then we've got this added functionality. Okay. So if I'm back up, and just show you a couple other things. So how many of you guys were actually able to download what I had on GitHub and unzip it? That's your right. Yay. Okay. So in here, you've got all the files. And that came along with it. There's actually a little R project file in here. Um, this is something I'm not 100% sure it'll work. <laughs> But we're going to try it, so I'm going to let you guys test this for me. I think if you double click on that, it will open. It should open if you have RStudio installed. It should open in RStudio. And when it does, you'll actually be inside a project for what we're doing here in the class. So just give that a shot and try it. Tell me if it worked. It did? All right, awesome. 
it, there's a little file that has a .rpoj. So just double click it, and if you have RStudio installed, it should work. If you don't have RStudio installed, it probably won't know what to do. So, oh, that worked. Okay. Yep, you're in. So it's the little file. Uh, well, um, close our studio. And then where did you download? <laughs> okay. Um, it's probably that. Although that looks like it's still zipped. Did you unzip it? Okay. That's where it downloaded. Right. And then somewhere down towards the bottom, it did that file. And if you double click on it, it'll open in our studio. Did that work for you guys? Yay. Did you, are you, or do you didn't have our studio it. yet? I, it said it downloaded, but I didn't see it anywhere. Okay. All right. Well, the, the thing is, basically, the great thing about working with R is, um, well, with our studio, sorry, is you can manage things inside projects. So I'll show you one other way to do it. That's the fastest way. The other way is if you open our studio, just vanilla. <coughs> so I'll show you what this looks like. If I right now it's tied to a project, so I'm not. I'm going to technically close my project so you guys can see what happens if I close this out. So if you open our studio and you've never done anything before it, up at the top under this little console, there's a little on my screen. It has a little tilde followed by a slash. And it's technically in my, whatever my computer thinks is my home directory, which for me I think is my document directory. I think that's the default in Windows, um, which is fine. And I could go through my file menu and hunt and peck and try to find on my hard drive where all these files are. But it's best to manage it inside a project. So I'm going to just show you this one thing. So when you're in here, you can come in and say you want to have a new project. And you can create a brand new directory. In your case, you downloaded those files, so they exist in whatever un what directory you created when you unzipped everything. Um, so you could go to that existing directory and create a project to bring in all of those files. The other one, and this is the one I teach my students, is version control. This one actually links you live to GitHub, which we won't do. But it turns out you can do that. So with an existing directory, I could actually come in here and on my hard drive, for me, I can just kind of show you. Um, I have a directory down here called SNRS, Reproducible Research. And if I click on that folder and say open, it creates that project directory. I've already done this, but I just wanted you guys to see how that happens. So um, if the file's already there and that project file has been created, then you can do what we did just a minute ago. You can just double click on it and it opens that project in our studio. So I'm going to go back and do that. So I'm going to come in here and say open project and then go find it on my hard drive. So I'll do it one more time. I'm also doing this so it'll be on the video recording and you guys will be able to see it. All right, so there's that project file and click open. And this does a couple of things. Besides sort of making sure that you, you, you're in that directory where all the files are, it sets it up so if I click on files over here, okay, I can see everything that was in that repository that you downloaded. But up at the top, it now says, I'm, I'm, this is on my hard drive, I have a GitHub subdirectory and then I have one called SNRS 2018 Reproducible Research. And I would advise you, as you start working with R and RStudio, create a new project for everything you're working on. Have a clean directory that just has the files in there that you want to work with and so forth, because it'll keep things nice and neat and clean and sort of organized. Um, the other thing is, too, as you start running code, the code's going to assume, at least initially, that the data is in the same directory. Now you can start to get into directory management where, and I, for those of you that work at SPSS, and I'm looking at you because you mentioned it, um, I am forever in the wrong directory in SPSS, where I've got the data file and I go to save my output, and it defaults to the directory of the previous person's project, and when I get done, I'm like, where did my output go? 
and I have to go search for it on my hard drive. So in our studio, if you set this up with projects, everything is at least inside that main directory. And there's a few little subdirectories in here where I've got like some images, and all those images are in an image folder. Um, for the purposes of what we're doing in the exercises, you, you won't see that. But when I was putting together all the slides, turns out if you really want to see where all my little graphic images in my slides came from, they're in that images folder. So if you wanted to play around with images, you could look at those. All right, so that's just some stuff on sort of project management. Um, all right, well, let's just try some R code. The other thing I love about the RStudio interface is that it recognizes and understands all these different types of files. So module 202.r is the first little set of R code that I'm going to show you all. So if you want to open it, feel free to do so. Um, and I'm going to type some of this stuff here at the command line just to get you a feel for getting started. So you could actually just here at the base console type math. So like I could type in 1 plus 1 and it would give me 2. I could type 2 raised to the power of 3 and I'd get 8. So I have the ability to come in here and use R basically as a glorified calculator. Um, turns out if I type in it's too bad this wasn't a week ago. It would have been on Pi Day. <laughs> um, if I type in Pi, I get the first, uh, let's see, for six digits of Pi. Um, and, you know, there's other functions in here that I can call, like I could find. Turns out log, the log function is a natural log. Um, and something else to notice here is that I typed in log followed by parentheses, and then I put a number in here. So um, SPSS sort of works this way with syntax, where you type a command and then in parentheses you put in. So like if you're wanting to find the mean across a bunch of variables, you type in mean and then you list in variable one, variable two, or item response one, item response two. Same kind of idea. Um, SAS is sort of similar. There's, there's some differences with SAS. Um, but you're going to see this over and over, where we're going to have a thing where we type a function or a command and then in parentheses, we put in the data, or we put in the option, or the setting for whatever makes that command work. So you get kind of slow if I had to type this over and over. So it turns out I've actually put all of this stuff in a script. And so this is our code that's sitting in just basically a text file. Turns out I can actually look at this R code using something like Notepad. So if I find that file module 2 R code here, oh, sorry, you guys were supposed to tell me it's 205. You want to take a quick break? Sorry, I don't want you guys to miss the refreshment. So let's take a quick break. I'll pause my recording, and I'll come back to this. All right, so I'm going to just I'm gonna keep going so we don't lose too much time. So you kind of get the idea, um, you know, this is – Great, you can sort of use it as a calculator. Um, you can type commands in. You don't always have to save them. But in general, I think the workflow is better if you set up a script file that's just basically a plain text file that you're, you're saving your R code in. Um, and how I created this was I actually clicked on File, New File, and then there's a bunch of options here. And I'm going to show you guys R Markdown in a minute. But the first one I'm showing you is you're just you're creating an R script. And it again, it's just a basic text file, but R knows how to read the code, and it uses coloring to help you understand, okay, this is a data file, this is a variable, this is a command, this is an option, that kind of thing. So that's how I created this file. And so some of the coloring that you see going on in here is I've got little hashtags for my comments. So I've, I've added comments as I go. So this is beginning of sort of dynamic documentation. I've got a little bit of text and information with my code. Um, but we're going to do a lot more with that. Um, so that's what that piece is. If I scroll down just a little bit further, I've got some more code. So another thing about R that's different than, say, SAS, SPSS, and I would wager maybe even Stata and definitely Jump. One thing I love about Jump is that the data and the visualizations, the graphics are tied. So in, and for those of you, I don't know, not many people in here maybe have used Jump, but in Jump, I can have like a scatter plot, and 
in my scatter plot, I can actually highlight points in my scatter plot and they will show up highlighted in my data table, which is awesome. SAS doesn't do that. SPSS doesn't do that. Um, it turns out there actually are some add-on packages to R that you can do that. I can't name them off the top of my head, <laughs> but I'm hoping more software picks that up in the future. And that's one thing I love about Jump. So uh, a selling point for there for Jump. Um, but all of those packages and all of those statistical software packages, even Excel for that matter, is you start with your data file and that container has everything in it. It has the variables that you've collected, it has all the information on all of your rows, your cases, your subjects, time points, etc. Ours is a little bit different. So it was originally created, and so this is the part where it starts to look more like a programming language. Technically, it's an object-oriented programming language. So we have to create containers for these for objects. And those objects are most likely going to be your primary data file, but they don't have to be. So it gives you some added flexibility, which is awesome in the long run, but I will tell you, based on working with students and learning R, that's the biggest hurdle to overcome. <laughs> because it's so easy to create a variable on, you know, out in your environment called age that's just out there by itself. It's just a list of the ages. But then in your data set, you have a variable called age that's inside the data container. So this is the part that gets a little tricky. So I just kind of want to show you a little bit about objects here. So just like I typed one plus one, I can save that value and put it inside a container called A. And it turns out the assignment operator in R is this less than dash. You can actually type equals, that will work. I could type A equals one plus one, and then the value of A would store, or the object A would store the value of two. Um, but the convention is to actually use this um, less than followed by a dash. And it turns out, remember I mentioned the guys that originally created S at Bell Labs? Their keyboard was not the standard QWERTY keyboard. It was actually a data entry programming keyboard. And there was a button on that keyboard that was the assign button that was this less than dash. Because <laughs> there's always a great quiz that goes on in R's like, why do we have to use this silly symbol? Because <laughs> that's what it was originally. <laughs> so anyhow, so that's what that means. Um, so it turns out if I have an R script, I can highlight lines of code and just click run. And I don't have to retype everything down here. So it's kind of the method that we'll be using going forward. They're just having too much fun next door. <laughs> Um, the other thing you notice up here when I did it the first time, I typed 1 plus 1 and it automatically spit back the answer to. Notice here I've got 1 plus 1, I signed it to A and nothing happened. Where did it go? So up at the very top, there's a whole series of little buttons and tabs up here. I'm not going to worry about history connections or Git, but the first one says environment. <laughs> Oh, she went longer than I did. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so your environment is basically all the things that you're creating and doing as you go. And it turns out in SPSS and SAS and stuff, something similar like that's happening <coughs> under the hood where things are oftentimes being created in temporary memory. They do stuff to it, and then the output shows up in the output screen or in the plot window or whatever it is for the software that you're using. Um, R is more methodical about it. So I can create these objects and then they start showing up in my environment. And so I can track them up there. Um, so just as an example, now that I've got that value of two stored, um, it turns out I can either run that code or I can just type the letter A and I can see, oh, it's a value of two. The environment window up there actually shows me the value of two stored in something called A. This is the other reason I really like the RStudio interface is that this environment window gives you a chance to peek inside and see what all is there. Um, and then I can do things with it. So I've now got this object A. If I took and raised it to a power of 3, 2 raised to the power of 3 is 8. I could use that same thing, store it in an object called B. You get the idea. Just a couple of other things to show you. 
I can create vectors. So this no a string of numbers is called a vector. Um, I can store them. I can do things with them. So I could, could take the numbers 1 to 10, multiply them all by 4. I could take the sign of those, and then I could store them in different objects, x1, x2, and x3. So if I run these, <clears throat> so now I've got more stuff. So initially I just started with some basic things, just an object that had a number, not terribly exciting. But now I've got these things called x1, x2, and x3. They're all numeric. They have 10 values each in them, et cetera. And this is the part that I really like about R, but again, is a piece that's a little confusing at the beginning. If I wanted to make a plot of, say, those values from 1 to 10, against the sign of those values. I'll, I'm going to make a really crude sine curve here, sinusoidal curve. Um, and then these are some of the options in the plot command. So I'm going to show you in the help window. And it's, it's hard for me to get the font big enough. I don't know why. I need to write to the editors of our studio. I'm like, can you please just up? Maybe it's just because I have old eyes. <laughs> but can you please make the font size bigger by default in the plot or in the uh, help window? Because when I'm teaching, especially you got somebody in the far back of the room, they just they can't see it. But it turns out any of the commands that I've used, if you type them up there in the search for the help it'll bring up the information page. So this is like looking up help in SPSS or in SAS or whatever, and you can go and read about it. And so it'll tell you what the plot command needs. It needs an x-axis data. It needs y-axis data. And then there's a bunch of different options. Um, there's actually entire books written on how to do plotting and graphics are. So you guys are just getting a little tiny taste. But the commands here where it says type equals b, B stands for both, so I'm going to have both points and lines. And then I can set the color to anything I want, and I just said blue. And so that's what each of these pieces are. There's basically four pieces of information going into the plot command, basically the X data, the Y data, what kind of plot, both points and lines, and what color. And then when it, when it runs, you get a plot in the plot window. Make sense? Okay. Um, I could get a little fancier. I could create one more vector. This time, if I go back and look at my environment window, this vector, again, it's 10 elements long. But now I've got these 10 colors. I've got red three times, blue three times, and green four times. And notice in the environment window, it says it's CHR. It's character data, so it's text-based data. And you'll see this in SAS, and I think in JUMP, and even in SPSS, there's a different symbol for the kind of data that it is, whether it's numeric or, or string. You'll hear string used. <coughs> and again, I could use this instead of using just a single color blue, I can now use this vector of colors. And you'll notice that my first three points here are red, the next three are blue, and the next three are green, or the next four are green. So you can have all kinds of things to play around with. Wait, I'm sorry, say it one more time. They are. So X1 was the series of numbers from 1 to 10, and then X3 is the sign of those numbers. And the last vector that I had were the colors, and I set the color equal to that container. So that container had all the colors. And so when it does that, it reads off the first data point is going to be red, the second data point is red, and third data point, and so forth. So like you could do something like this in a scatter plot and set the color according to gender or race or something like that to have it adapt the colors in a different way. All right. But up to this point, I now have all these objects, and they're all separate from each other. So, for example, in SAS, I can't do that. If I want to pull this variable from this data set and this variable from, so let's say, for example, I've got demographics in this data set, and I've got another data set that has all of my lipid data. So I have the same number of subjects, and I can align them, and maybe they're all sorted and ready to go. But in SAS, I can't say, give me the um, ages 
from this file and everybody's total cholesterol from this file and make a plot. First thing you have to do in SAS is merge that data. Same thing in SPSS, same thing in honest, well, Excel, there's a little bit, like you can actually technically make plots where you're pulling data from the same file but off of different tabs, but that gets really confusing. Anyway, turns out in R you can do that. So it's great, huge flexibility, but it gets confusing fast. So really we'd like all of these things to exist in the same data set. And in R, sort of the default type, data type is something called a data frame. That's just the terminology they use. So most everything else we talk about data sets. Turns out I can combine all of these. So up here, I was using this little C where I combined the numbers. And it's just one little like variable, one little uh, set of numbers. Turns out if I use the data frame command, each of these are 10 elements long and I can put them together. And so when I do this, I get something up the top that now says data. Yay, we've got data. And, and nine times out of 10, you're not gonna be doing it this way. You're gonna have a file, you'll download it, import it, it'll load the data set for you. And I'll show you something in a minute about that. Um, but now I've got this thing called data frame one. I probably should use something more descriptive than that. But there's some neat things with the RStudio interface. You can click on this and you now can see here are basically now this looks like variable one, variable two, variable three, et cetera. And over here at the far right, there's something that kind of looks like a table. If I click on that, and it kind of went sort of fast, it actually under the hood ran the view command. So it turns out if you weren't using RStudio, if you were using bare bones R, you'd actually have to type view data frame and then it would open a window for you to look at it. So RStudio is a better way to do it because otherwise you gotta remember that command. <laughs> but now you can come in here and see your data. And you can, turns out you can actually look at, you can do some sorting um, so like if I wanted to sort things, um, if I wanted to alphabetize my colors, etc. It doesn't actually change the data structure, it just changes how you're viewing it. All right. There's some other things here, and I'm not going to go through all of these, just um, hopefully you guys will have some time to run these later. But it turns out there's ways to select data. So nine times out of ten, you're going to start with a data frame and then you're gonna be pulling things out of it. Like you might pull out all the women, or you might decide, I only wanna look at um, BMI and blood pressure or something like that. So there's ways to come in here and select rows or select columns. These are different ways to do that. So I could select individual elements from things or like in the data frame, I could say, okay, go find me the What's at the fourth row, second column? Um, and there's a bunch of other things that you can, like you can select an entire row. This is how to do that. I can select an entire column. But most of the time, you're probably not going to be working with it like that. I just wanted you to see it. Because if you ever look at R code, you'll see stuff like this. But if you get a data set in, there's a function called the names command, which I can sort of see here, but if you're like me, most of the data sets I have were especially working um, where I've got all the questionnaire and the raw item responses. Nine times out of 10, my data sets, I've got 3,000 variables and 50 subjects. <laughs> so I can't view everything at one time. Um, but that names command is really handy because this will then give you a list of all the variables in your data set. And you can like do searches and you can you can find where stuff is in your data set. Um, so I just wanted you to see that. But the primary way that we actually select variables is using a selector operator. And it's the dollar sign. Um, computer programmers will call that the string. Um, just like the exclamation point, have you ever heard anybody call it bang? So exclamation point is bang, the dollar sign is string. <laughs> this is sort of computer geeky logo. Um, but this is how you're gonna see it, <clears throat> where we say, okay, go into the data frame and pull out the variable, in this case, X3. So I can rewrite that plot command using not the objects that are out there floating around, but the data from my data set. And the way I do that is I say, I wanna select that first variable and plot it against the third variable and then the rest of the same and I'm bringing in the colors from the fourth variable. 
So that's what that's, and that's the kind of syntax you're usually going to see. Um, and you could run it if you want, just to, to prove to yourself that yes. Turns out, actually, and I don't, I noticed this, and I, I don't have an answer why the color, the default colors change in this plot from the other one. No idea. I'm going to have to post that one out on the help discussion board and go, can anybody explain to me why the coloring defaults are different? Um, there's probably a way to override it, but that sort of was fascinating to me that now my line is green and not red. Not, I can't explain it at the moment. Um, something else to show you while I'm standing here. Under File, this, I can't remember which version of R Studio, but it should be in the ones you have. There's a link here under File for Import Dataset. And you can import not only from text in Excel, but from SPSS, Data, and SAS. And this is awesome. And I've had this work. So I actually had something the other day with I'm working with somebody who's working with Stata. I could not get SPSS to read the Stata file, but I could get R to view it, and then I was able to export it from R. So I was like, okay, eventually uh, you know, there's a way to sort of get around that. Um, so the import here works really well. Go ahead. That's a whole other lecture. <laughs> Dates and times are hard. Um, yeah, we can talk about that some more. Um, there are some ways. I, I don't think if you use this, there's some there's some other tools in R for doing that. Matter of fact, Hadley Wickham. So the package that I had, the first one, big one that I had you guys download, Tidyverse, has a whole bunch of packages in it. One of which, I can't remember if it gets loaded by default, but it's called Lubridate that he wrote. And Lubridate is fantastic. Um, if you remind me at the end, his book on using R for data analysis, and I think that's the title, is online and free. You can you can buy it and pay for it in hard copy, but it's online. And the, he's actually, con even though it's published now, he's continuing to update it online. Um, there's a whole chapter on dates and times. And anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, here, I'll show you. So it's R, okay, if I type in Hadley Wickham, and Hadley Wickham is the chief scientist of RStudio, so it's R for, oh, R for data science, not data analysis. So it's R for data science. Here's the book, and so here's the chapter on dates and times, <laughs> but it has a whole bunch of stuff. Now, again, this gets a, it's a little programmy. Um, so you kind of have to, you're, you're sort of learning some of the heart and guts of some of the things in R, but there's some really good examples in here, and he does a pretty good job of laying those out and how to work with it. All right. So, okay. So just those are some basic things to get started using R. Um, a couple other things just to point out. So I mentioned the environment that, like, as we were creating these objects, they're showing up here in my environment. So this is kind of like my data environment. But it turns out there's also a programming environment. And so this is a fantastic little, it's documented, but um, if you run this command session info, and by the way, R is case sensitive. So this word is lowercase session, and the I in info is capitalized. So if you type it with lowercase i, it'll come back and give you an error. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Nine times out of 10, if you get an error in R, it's probably because there's a typo. and you have a capital and it wants a lowercase or vice versa. Um, but session info will tell you what packages you currently have access to. So if I run this, make it a little bit bigger so you can kind of see it, it gives me some basic information. It tells me which version of R I'm running. Y'all's may be slightly different because I think, honestly, it updated in the last couple of days. So you may, be, you may have 3.4.4. .4. I don't know. Um, it tells me what platform uh, that I'm running on. And this actually has been sort of fun in my big data class because, like I said, about half of my students have Macs and half have Windows. And we occasionally get some differences. Not so much in the output, but in how the software 
is acting or the, the Mac users get one kind of error and the Windows users get a different kind of error. So, so sometimes this is handy to know if you ever post out on the help board, somebody will ask, well, what's your operating system? There's a whole bunch of other details like this becomes important if you're working internationally to know what locale and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you'll notice it says attached base packages. So when I said you install R, you get a basic stats, you get a basic graphics, there's some graphic devices stuff here. It turns out there's a built-in set of data sets that you can play with, um, some methods, and then the base software. So I haven't added in, there's some other things here that I, we'll just ignore this for a minute. Um, so that's basically the attached packages right now. So I don't have any of this additional functionality. So remember I said you guys downloaded and you've installed these packages. To use the stuff that's in those packages, you have to load it. And that command is library. So if I want to use the functions that I'm going to, you guys are going to see some stuff with dplyr and ggplot here in a minute, um, I have to run tidyverse. And so when I run that, it'll do some stuff and it turns out tidyverse is actually a, a collection of packages. That's why I had you download that one first. Um, and you get this plotting, there's a whole bunch of other programming stuff, there's um, dplyr, and then there's some some uh, files for reading other files and stuff. Anyway, these come along with it. Now if I click session info again, I've got a ton more stuff. <laughs> so in addition to my base packages, I now have all these other attached packages, and it turns out there's a whole bunch of other stuff that kind of gets loaded in kind of a temporary memory, and I won't get into all the specifics of this. Hadley Wickham talks a lot about this in his book, if you really want to understand. But there's just a ton more things now that I can do without having to just use base R. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it stays loaded for your current session. So up here, if I were to exit out of the software, I quit the session. Um, it turns out there's a way also without actually completely quitting our studio. If you click um, quit session, it'll actually clear everything out and it kind of resets things. It's kind of like rebooting your computer, <laughs> honestly. Um, but if you do that, then all of this stuff, it doesn't uninstall. It just uh, unloads out of memory. So, and that sometimes it's good to do that. But yes, question. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for taking pictures. Um, and I won't be able to diagnose all of this. If you click on packages, does it show up in your packages list? So scroll down. It, I thought we saw it earlier. In mine, it was. But this is the one that you. Yeah. Click. Click the little button next to Tidyverse. All right, that worked. So um, here, let me show you what I, I just I did on her computer. So occasionally, the library command, I don't know why, but another way to load packages here is if I scroll down. Um, so where's Tidyverse? Um, I can actually click this button. It's already clicked, but if you click that, it will also load the package. Basically, it, when you click that button, it runs the library command. So. Um, to give it a shot, but I'm going to keep going because I think we might run out of time. Um, the only thing I wanted you to guys to see with the piece here is Hadley Wickham has kind of restructured a little bit how people are learning R, but also how they're using R. So back up here at the top where I was showing you guys some of the plot command stuff, Initially, I started with just independent objects where I just had X1 and X3. But ideally, you're really going to be working with those inside a data frame or a data set. So I have to type data frame dollar sign X1. Then I have to type the name of the data frame dollar sign X3, with, you know, the different variables. It's good. It's well defined, but it gets very long. And that's a kind of cumbersome. It gets very lengthy because you could imagine if your data frame is called, you know, project ABC. <laughs> Um, you know, so it can get very long. And then if your variable name is really long, um, it's a problem. So he's created this approach that uses something called pipes. So just trust me on this. 
And basically what it does is it's coming from this package that you guys have loaded automatically with Tidyverse from something called dplyr. Um, and what it does is it says, take my data set and pipe it into whatever I want to do to that data set. And if I want to select a single variable out of that data set, there's a select command. So what it does is now I can get back to calling the variables by their variable name, and it knows that it's coming from that data set. And it turns out there's ways to do this with the plotting environment also. And so ggplot2 is a package that's inside Tidyverse. And the way this works is that you can go ahead and just put the data set name up front, and then you just work with the variables inside that data set. At that point, it knows, oh, you're working with this data set, and everything else that comes after it is inside that data set. So it just makes it a little cleaner, and you're not having to constantly retype the name of the data set every single time. I won't explain a lot. You'll have to just read more about uh, ggplot, but it uses something called aesthetics. And basically all I'm doing here is saying that my x-axis is x1, my y-axis is x3, and then I'm adding a layer of points, and I'm coloring them by x4, that string of colors, and I'm going to have a line that I'm adding, and I'm going to explicitly this time make my line red. And so, um, so this is what you're going to see in the example code coming up. So there you go. All right. So module three, and I'm just going to highlight some things in module three because I'm going to skip ahead because I'm, I've gotten too long-winded. So in module three, what this does is this is a copy of the code that you're going to see in the R Markdown document that I'll show you in just a minute. The first thing it does is it loads all the packages. These are the ones that have functions later on that show up. And the first thing that it does and I have, I have everything documented here, is it loads a data set out of the 538 package called stake survey, which is that stake survey thing that I mentioned about looking at risk and how well done or rare you like your stake. Um, and then there's some other things that I'm doing down here, and the code's here for you. I'm not going to explain all of it. Um, but basically what I've done initially is I've created a subset out of here based on the region of the United States that I want to look at. It turns out there's nine different regions of how they coded this data from the United States. So for example, if I just wanted to look at the survey results from the mountain region of the United States, I could use a filter, pull out the data from mountain. I can do a table of um, the age category. So what it does is it says, okay, go and find the age variable. I'm going to create a table and I'm going to calculate the proportions multiplied by 100 because I'd like to have all those in counts and percents. And um, just know for right now <laughs> that there's a table package that allows you to make tables. I will say this. I'm giving you guys this code, but um, making tables directly from R is challenging. I'll just leave it at that. There's a lot more to read out there on that. Um, but this sets it up where basically I've created that table of data, and I bring it in. In this case, I'm making an HTML file. That's why that's there. Um, but I put a label, ages in the percent. I've got a, a caption, which likes a title. And then there's some formatting stuff that that cable extra package brought in. And then I make a plot. And so these are all just different layers that go in. But basically, it's saying start with that subset of the data for the mountain region. And I'm going to look at how people like their steak prepared. So it gives me categorical response of like from rare to well done. Um, and I'm going to color code them by gender. In this case, the, they called the variable female. So I think it was female was one, male was zero. That's how that was coded. And then there's some other like labeling things going on in here. And I've added the 538 theme. So that GG themes package, if you want to make plots that look like, at least how they looked on the old 538.com website, you can actually use their coloring and font style and all that kind of thing. So this code you're going to see in the R Markdown file. So what is R Markdown? You can actually, and if you have R Studio up and running, try this. Click on, if I can keep my mouse there, click on New File, R Markdown. So if you don't learn anything else about R, 
<laughs> play with this when you get home. You don't have to even write code. You can just play with this file. Turns out you can create documents, which is where I'm going to have you guys start, but you can do presentations. So the slides that I showed you guys this morning, that's how I created my slides. Something called Shiny, which I won't get into, that's for building like interactive dashboards um, for data and stuff. <coughs> and it turns out um, you guys won't have these packages installed, but I'll show you. This is an area that I'm trying to learn how to develop in. You can actually create all of these templates. So there's a couple of different ones out here. Let's see if I've got... Um, Yeah, under file, new file, R markdown. Oh, if it does, then just click yes and go ahead. It, it may well, it may prompt you to download something. But it turns out there's a package out there called articles. And um, in that package, and they keep adding to this. So, for example, if I was submitting a manuscript to the ACS, to the American Chemical Society, if I come in here and click that template, <coughs> turns out it's LaTeX code, heaven forbid. Um, but it opens a file, and it has everything blocked out and listed the way ACS wants to see it. Like there's a section for abstract, section for background, all that. It's, it's the template. And I can sit down and just start writing my article. And if I have analysis, I can put in a little bit of R code to do the analysis. Or if I have something that I'm making a graph, it's all there. And when I'm done, I can save that file, send it to the ACS, along with my data, they now have my data, my code, and the document, and they can compile it. And when you're done, it's going to look just like it looks in the journal. So I won't get a chance to demonstrate that, but just know that this is an area of active development. Elsevier supports this. The PLOS journals support this. I think this is going to be the wave of the future with a lot of publishing. <clears throat> so for right now, let's just do a simple document. Type in some title, like my first document. Um, you can type in your author name. For right now, I'm just going to use HTML. Out of the box, just so you guys know, HTML and Word will work today. If you want to do PDF, you have to also install <laughs> a LaTeX package. So I'm not going to show you PDF. Um, but it turns out if you want to, this turns out MCTEX and MACTEX for Windows and Mac are free. You can also install that. Once that's installed, then this should work. But for right now, I'm just going to click HTML and click OK. All right. So here's what R Markdown looks like. And there's kind of three pieces to R Markdown. The first is the header information. And just to let you know, this is something called YAML. Not that that's important. But basically, it's the header. And so it has already defined, because we typed this into the little interface at the beginning, as a title, my author name, today's date, and what kind of output file. In this case, I'm creating an HTML file. These other pieces that are in here are basically, this is code. This is our code that's embedded. Um, this is actually setting up some stuff for Knitter when it compiles the document. And I'll show you that in a second. The rest of this is markdown. So like I said, I wanted some really, really simple syntax for being able to change how the date or how the text is displayed at the end. So there's some things in here like these two hashtags says I want to set the word R markdown as a level two header. Um, this little the little less than greater than sign makes this a hyperlink. Um, the word knit has two little stars next to it that makes it a bold word. So to learn more about this, if you click on Help, there's a button or a link here for it says Markdown Quick Reference. And it'll open this up in the Help window. And so it shows you that like if I type a single asterisk on either side or a single underscore, it'll make whatever that word is italics. If I do two, it makes it bold. Um, I can change the style of my header, level one, level two. I think it'll go to level six, actually. Um, by just adding hashtags in front of it. I can make unordered and ordered lists. Um, there's some line breaks, there's links, there's ways to embed images, block quotes, all kinds of stuff. But just know this file here is a default that you can sort of play with. And so one of the things, it turns out the base R package has these built-in data sets. There's one called cars. Basically it has miles per hour and 
or size of miles per gallon or something like that. Anyway, and it, this gives me just basically some summary statistics on that data set. And then there's another little section here where I can do a plot of another built-in data set called the pressure data set. And then there's some other mark marking in here that, that's changing the formatting of the text. So if you got that up, up here at the top, under knit, is the ability to create now a final document. So try clicking, if you've got it up, click knit to HTML. The first time you do this, it's going to ask you to save it. So I'm going to just call it my first doc, click save. And for those of you that just installed the software, it may also prompt you to install Knitter and our Markdown. It may it may ask you to do a couple things. So I know that went really fast. I'm going to do it one more time. If I click Knit the HTML, it turns out, and this goes by pretty quick, there's a tab that opens over here called our Markdown, and it's processing the file. And then over here on the right in the viewer window, you now should see something that looks kind of like a web page. It's got my header, it's got some information, it has this link, the word knit is in bold, it shows me a little bit of the code. Oh, speed and distance, I couldn't remember. So it gives me some summary statistics of speed and distance, and then here's my plot. Everything is connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I could do something like that, and it's for that matter, I mean, I've got the summary of the CARS data set. I could actually add a plot of the CARS data set, and if I click Save, and now I re -knit my document. So here's the line that I just added, and then down here, here's the summary statistics. Here's the plot of the CARS data set, and I mean, that was, what, 30 seconds? So it's fantastic. Right. Yeah, that's a built-in data set. Exactly. Yeah, at that point, that's the part that gets more into the R programming piece that we won't have time to do today. But I wanted you guys to see and get a chance to play with this infrastructure because it's so powerful. Um, and on a couple more clicks, if I click knit to Word, I'm assuming at this point everybody's got Microsoft Word. Turns out you can actually knit to other open source document formats that you, you don't have to be tied to Microsoft. But here you go. So here's that same document in Microsoft Word. Yes. So, so everybody I work with, every team I am on, we eventually end up here in some kind of Microsoft Word document. Oh, yeah. So, okay. So, it, yeah, the formatting is a little bit different. So, here's that summary. So, here's the plot. Yes. So, at this point, it's like I can reformat it. I could copy and paste it. I can add other stuff over it. Yeah, at this point, it's an editable Word document. Now, having said that, <laughs> if you start editing this document, you're editing Microsoft Word. At this point, you are outside of our studio it, our studio would not know that you've made those changes so if you're if you're doing this process you make all the changes here and this is where i give my students some some latitude so they're all working on their projects right now and i've pretty much told them because making a table in our markdown and getting it into your final presentation or, or their final report i'm like i'm okay if you just want to create the table in microsoft word that's fine, because <laughs> tables are hard. But we're encouraging them to use this workflow as much as possible. So, um, okay, so that's that's a basic document. And like I said, I'm not going to get a chance to show you everything, but the code that was here in Module 3 um, is going to show up again. Let me just show you what was in Module 4. So Module 4 is our markdown file. This is just a basic, I, I expanded that simple file that's built in. And I basically took this, or no, actually this is the same one, I'm sorry, my bad. Um, this is 
what I just showed you. That's what Module 4's file is. There's one more file down here that says Module 4 R Markdown Example, and that R Markdown file, which has RMD at the end, has more stuff in it. And so what I would say is take this file and play with it on your own. And so this shows like here's a level one, here's level two, level three header. It has some more examples of how to put in a link. So like I can put the word Google in square brackets and then I put the actual like HTTP, the URL there. Um, here's an example bold and italics. Um, turns out this shows how to put in just some some exa an example piece of code, a non-numbered list, here's an ordered list, uh, an example of a block quote, um, embedded um, R code, which you see here. And the thing you'll notice is that um, it starts with these three back ticks and then in curly bracket, it has the letter R. So that tells RStudio this is R code and so what it does is temporarily it stops processing the document and it switches and processes the, the R code, grabs that output and brings that output and embeds it back in the document. That's actually what Knitter's doing. So when Knitter's doing that, it's handling simultaneously the running of the R code, taking that output and bringing it back in, as well as processing the document and fixing all the formatting. Um, so that's the piece that I think is really kind of neat. And then there's a couple other examples, excuse me, down here on making some tables. So there's an example of how to make a table, how to put in an equation. You guys are probably not going to be typing a lot of equations. And a footnote example down here. And I won't get a chance to explain all of that, but this is an example file that if you click knit, you'll create that HTML file and you can now sort of play with this and go in change it around, try other things, try some other code. Um, here's an example of the table, there's the equation, here's some footnotes. So, and again, you could send this to Microsoft Word. So I wanted to give you guys enough stuff that you could take it home and test it out. Let me show you a couple of other neat things with RStudio, or with um, R Markdown. So there's a couple other examples. There's a file here that says Module 4 IO Slides, Module 4 Reveal JS, which I didn't tell you guys to install that package, so we can skip that one for now, and Module 4 Slidey. So it turns out, if you come up here to New File, R Markdown, instead of a document, I could do a presentation. So um, again, for the PDF, you'd need, you'd need a LaTeX um, package, but these two, IO Slides and Slidey, are built in. And just for an example, if I click Slidey and I could say my first slides and click OK, it gives you a little template to play with. And it turns out when you're doing slides, um, these level two headers designate a new slide. So in this case, I'd have a slide that said our markdown with a little bit of formatted text. This would be my second slide with some bullets. This would be another slide with the summary statistics of the CARS data set. And finally, a slide that has a plot. So if I click knit, first notice that the labels here have changed. <laughs> it says IO slide, slidey, or beamer. Beamer is a PDF format. But I want to do slidey. So if I click this one, oh, and it'll ask me to save it. So my first slides, and click uh, save. So this is another type of slide format. And so you can actually, you can swipe. I can't know if my swipe is going to work. Or I can click page up and page down. So here's slide one, slide two, slide three, and slide four. Oh, I don't know why my, oh, I probably because I need to make my screen bigger. OK, so that's what these examples are that are down here. And you guys are welcome to take a look at them. This one, and I haven't explained it, there's a, another package that you can install, install called Reveal.js. That's another kind of slide presentation. There's a whole bunch of them out there. That's one. There's a new one called Zerigan that's actually spelled with an X. Um, so this is another area of active development. But there's some examples here later if you want to take a look at those. All right. So let's skip ahead a little bit. Module 5. And Module 5, 6, and 7 are, or 5 and 6 are really, really close to the same thing. All right. 
So without explaining everything that's going on in here, this R Markdown file is going to write a report for the stake preferences in the United States. So it's got some header information. You'll notice I added a little piece. I actually added a subtitle because primarily I'm looking at stake preferences, but I'm looking at it in this case for the mountain region. Um, there's some, some setup pieces up here, and the only thing I'll say is there's these options that you can set when you use Knitter to compile a document, and you can tell it whether you want to show or hide the code. When you're first starting out, I recommend being able to see the code so you can kind of see what's going on. But at the end, when you're done, all you want to see are the results. You don't want to see it. This is the code that created the results. It's in there. It's, it's connected, and it's part of the same file, but you don't necessarily need to see it in the final printed copy. Um, and so there's some things in here that you can turn on and off. Echo is basically, do you want to see the code or not? You can set that to true or false. And you can also print out warnings and messages. So uh, just in general, I wanted you to see that because that's helped for debugging. There's some things here to clean up stuff in the tables, packages. So this is the other place that people will trip up when you're first learning to play with um, our markdown. So remember way back when I first got us going and we, we had an empty environment and then we started creating like A, B, X1, X2. So I was adding things to the environment and then we created that data set. Okay, that was back working in sort of the main, my global session, if you will. Turns out, when I use R Markdown and I knit and create and compile a new document, it opens a new session in temporary memory that's empty. And I have to, anything that I need for that document, I have to create right then. Even if I've already kind of got it created back where I was testing and playing with stuff, everything I need to make that document has to be in the document. So, and the reason this is nice is, let's suppose, UD and I are actually working on something together. I've got something running on my machine. She's got something running on her machine. Maybe we're sharing this R Markdown document. So I could have other stuff open on my desktop inside that R session that she doesn't have. She maybe has other things going on. But if we both have that same R Markdown document, and everything we need is in it, she and I should both be able to knit that document and get the same report, if you will. So you might say, why do I have to re reload all the R packages? Well, because I'm starting a brand new temporary session in memory. So even though I've loaded them back what we were doing before, the R markdown package actually has to have that information. Otherwise, you're going to get an error. Nine times out of ten when you first start learning this, that's one of the errors you'll get. So that's why all of these have to be loaded. Same thing with the data set. I have to actually make sure that that data set's read in because my report is based on that data set. So all the stuff you have to do to set up your environment, read in your data set, that has to be in there somewhere. Anyway, so the rest of this code is the stuff I kind of showed you before. We're creating a subset of that mountain data set. And there's some background that I wrote up that I went and pulled from the 538.com site. I have a little bit of information here on the purpose. Um, this is the table of the age categories, so that's that code, and then the, the plot that I make. So if you have this file, which is module 5 R markdown, and I click, actually since, since it's not part of this, I'm going to knit to Word. We're going to see if this works. Because <laughs> that wasn't, I uploaded the HTML files, but I didn't try it in Microsoft Word. So that should work. I'm going to put this in edit mode so you guys can see a little bit better. So here's my report. So here's the background. It has the links to the different pieces, the original. St if you really want to go read the original article, you could click on that link. Here's the data. Again, that this is looking at the specifically the mountain region. Here's, um, oh, the table doesn't work. Okay, sorry. Never do something live during a presentation that you haven't tested. Okay, <laughs> we'll go back and show it to you in HTML. But the plot does work. I told you tables are tricky. All right, so I'm going to do it one more time. This time I'll knit to HTML. The reason that that didn't work, just so you guys know, um, is because I have this little thing that I'm forcing it to format it to HTML. Um, actually, tables are just hard to do, and actually getting them into Microsoft Word is a, a royal pain. 
turns out getting them to HTML or PDF works really, really well. I think it's because most of these guys are Unix programmers. They hate Windows and Microsoft. <laughs> so Microsoft product support is an afterthought, but it is getting better. Um, so here's the, here's the HTML file. Um, again, you sort of see how this looks, but here's the table. So it's actually much prettier in HTML. Um, and then here's the plot. So this is all fine and good, and you're like, oh, okay, well, this is cool. I get it. If I learn R code, I can now take the R code, I can combine it with my data, and I can create a report. Notice I did this for the mountain region. What if I wanted to look at another region? Am I going to go in there and change the word mountain? And Anyway, so I'd like to be able to automate that. This is the last thing I'm going to show you guys. So in module six, not our markdown file, I've actually added a feature. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring these up side by side so you guys can see it. So in my original one, I've got title, author, subtitle, date, and I've actually created two different output formats. That's why this shows up twice. Um, and so that's all my stuff. But mountain is typed in here sort of manually. What if I wanna change that? Turns out there's an option that you can add to this header information called a param, which is a parameter. So I can put this in, and it turns out in the um, original data file. Oh, so I can show you this real quick since I have the data. I have the data loaded. Oh, hold on. <coughs> hold on one second. <coughs> I'm just writing this so I can get the data up here. So here's the stake survey data set. And inside here, it has a whole bunch of variables in it. One of the variables that's in here is called region. So if I want to use that information when I write my report, this is how I set that up. So the region here is actually a variable in the stake data set. So I kind of have to know that going in what data set I'm working with for this report. And it turns out, of the nine different regions that are out there, one of them is New England. And I can show you really quick how to see that. So let's see. Well, let me make sure I'm typing this right. Let's take survey. Um, there's a table function. I'm, I'm just doing this so you can see it. So I can do a table quick. This just gives me a list of the categories. So here are the nine different regions that are in the stake survey data set. Um, so one way for me to write a new report is to type in what value I'm interested in. So I could actually have like a report for males, a report for females. And there's a little tiny piece of R code that gets embedded up here that says I'm, I'm creating something called params and under region, um, that's how I can get access to it. And so what I've done is this params region um, code, I've substituted everywhere that I had mountain before. So it turns out right here in the purpose, I said what region of the United States, it shows up again here. Um, not so much there. It shows up here in that my explanation of the plot and then in the title of the plot, um, I just I went through and made those substitutions. So this time, when I click to knit to HTML, it's going to pull the region of the United States out of that header information. And so now instead of the mountain region, I've got a report for New England. All right, the last thing I'm going to show you is this last file, module six params list. There's actually a much easier way to do this. It takes a little more programming on the front end, but on the back end, it's very simple. Um, so I've made the substitutions where I'm using this parameter that I've defined for region. I made the substitutions. I can actually build a pick list. This is actually leveraging Shiny. I'm not going to teach you guys. I, I still don't even understand. This is as much Shiny as I know. <laughs> this is the idea that you can build sort of these interesting dashboards. But it basically now you're starting to build a user interface for the document. And this is how you set it up. There's some really good tutorials online on how to do this. But this time, if I take this document, instead of clicking it to HTML, 
By the way, if I just clicked one of those, it'll default to whatever default value I've defined in this case. If I don't change anything and just click a knit button, it'll compile this document by default for the mountain region. But if I want to change it, there's an option here for knit with parameters. So if you've opened that params list, our markdown file, you click knit with params, it, notice down here at the bottom it says it's running shiny. <laughs> So I now have this neat little interface, and I can scroll through and pick. So pick one. Which one do you guys want to see? East, South, Central. All right. I'm going to click it. So when this runs, I should now get a brand new report for East, South, Central. And so I know I threw a lot at you. But this is the end goal, I think. It's, it's not just that you've got your code and your data and everything's linked, but you can make this report more modular, more customizable. Um, and if anything in your, your data ever updates, like so, for example, 538.com, I forget, there were like 500 people in this survey. Suppose they went back and did this survey again, maybe five years later, and they added another 500 people. Assuming that they didn't change the format or the variable names or any of that stuff, I could easily go back and run the same report, but now I'm running it against 1,000 people instead of 500, or 50 in, or 100 instead of 50, or what, whatever it is. So um, I encourage you guys to play with it. Even if you never use it again, just know it's out there, and that I think you're going to start to see more of these elements showing up in a other software packages and the publishing world is kind of starting to embrace this a little bit more and the software designers are trying to make it more integratable and so forth um any quick questions i've got a couple more like help resource things i want to show you guys before we break up but there is a way to do it i can't remember right the second the code to do it, but it is, yeah, you can do that. And when that um, knit with parameters um, module pops up, it would have multiple things. Like you'd have, like suppose I had region, gender, and something else. I, I could have it where I could select different different things. So it is possible to do that. It takes a little more shiny programming, <laughs> and I don't know all of that. I If I had to guess right now, I would say it's basically just simply something like this that you repeat for whatever that next variable is. So like if I wanted to do gender, I'd probably just same sort of format. It said instead of nine choices, I'd have male and female. I mean, you could have more than that, but anyway. So I think it's definitely doable. Um, I just haven't built one yet. <laughs> so good question. Anybody else? All right. So while you guys are sitting here captive for five, ten more minutes, <laughs> um, so places to go and get help. Um, our studio itself is fantastic. So in addition to their products here, if you under their resources, um, there's all these cheat sheets. So you can, I saw a little bit with that R Markdown little help of viewer. Um, but there's webinars and videos and a bunch of online learning that's available. Um, and it's all free and very helpful. There's a website out there called Try, oh, I typed it wrong, sorry. Not Try T, oh, a pink video, okay. Try R. <laughs> um, it's done by a group called Code School, and this is free. And I've, it's kind of fun to do it because as you finish each chapter, you get a badge. Um, and so like this first one, if you click on our syntax, you don't even have to have R installed on your computer. This is all done through their interface. So it says, for example, suppose I wanted to type one plus one. The answer is two. Yay, it's printed immediately. And it, it, you get the idea. So it's, it's almost like an online game. Um, and it'll walk you through learning these different modules of R. Um, if you guys want to learn more about what it's my materials any of you guys ever use or seen Coursera so on Coursera if you type in reproducible research I think hold on we'll see how fast the 
internet is here. Hey, I came to the top. <laughs> Could just be because it's, it's something in my search engine. So this is me, reproducible templates for analysis and dissemination. So if you'd like to learn more, I encourage you guys to register for this class. Um, you can enroll and um, take it for free if you want to. You can basically be an audit auditor, and that's true for anything on Coursera, by the way. If you audit, you can do it all of them for free. Um, but if you want the credit, and there's some specialization certifications that, like, like if you take nine or ten classes, uh, you get a slightly prorated discount. But on average, I think the courses are about fifty dollars each, so it's it's not too onerous. Um, but this has a lot of what we did today, but kind of on steroids, goes a lot more in depth. Um, with any luck, hopefully I'll have a book out of this in the next year or so. We'll see. <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, another one that's really good is Data Camp. And um, I just started a contract with them for a, another kind of course, but um, I'm just starting to work with them. And they mostly focus on R and Python. But in there, if um, if you just click Start Learning R, um, it has a list of different um, modules. And most of these, it's like you can start the classes for free, and then if you want to take them, um, you have to pay some money. And they have like a yearly subscription. Um, and watch for sales. Like I, and around Christmas, they had a big promo, and you could get the whole year for a half price. Um, and it turns out for education, I'm doing this with my students. If you contact, they're like GitHub. If you contact them and say, I'm doing something for this class at this university this semester, you ask how many people you want to enroll. Um, I actually got all of my students six months free to data camp. So they can take any of the courses in here for free while they're enrolled in the big data course. Um, and so there's lots of things. I know this has got Python, but here's an introduction to our um, class that's in here. And this is a little bit different. This is not so much, Coursera is more like here's a video, here's an exercise, you know, submit your assignment, that kind of thing. Data Camp is more like an online game. <laughs> it's a little bit more like the Try Our website. You get XP. How many of you guys know what XP is? Okay, get out, feel so bad, because when somebody asks me, I'm like, I don't know what XP is. My dad went, you mean Windows XP? <laughs> My son goes, it's experience points. You're evidently gamers, you get XP. Anyway, I didn't know that either. <laughs> so, but, so you accrue these experience points. And so what it does is, um, let's see if I can sign in real quick. Uh, probably not gonna get my password right now. Oh, yeah. Um, so when you're in here, like the introduction to our class, it loads some stuff. Um, usually there's a short introductory video, sometimes there's little questions, but as you go through here it'll ask you ask you questions and then as you answer those questions it, you get points. Um, this isn't a good one to show you, but anyway. So Data Camp is another one. Um, and honestly there's so many different good books. I mentioned Bookdown and the only reason I'm going to show you that is this is there's a, a link to bookdown.org and these are all of the books that have been published and um, well not they're not all published but have been written and produced using the bookdown package and so most of these are available online for free some start out online for free and then when they're finally published the publisher may say no now we have the copyright and you have to pull it back offline so like for example this book down book was finally published by crc press initially when ueg was writing it you could go out and get everything for free i did go buy it i feel like i should support them but um but now i think like the first three chapters are available online for free um here's hadley wickham's book his is completely online for free um i mentioned roger ping or some of his books text mining this book got published last year with Julia Silge, um, and it's fantastic if you want to learn about using R to manage and manipulate text. Um, there's the exploratory analysis book down here. Roger Ping's written several, and you get the idea. So, And some of these are more well done than others. Some of these are in development, um, but I encourage you to take a look at it. So, 
I'm going to stop there. You guys all have my email. <laughs> Feel free to reach out to me. Um, when I get done with the recording, I will get it posted online and email everybody back. Did everybody get an email from me? I had a bounce back from one person. I wonder if it's the person that didn't come. So, all right, I'm going to stop my recording.